And now, taking the stage is Justin Azoff. Justin is a senior support engineer with Corelight. And Justin's going to talk about profiling and production. Please welcome Justin to the stage. Wow, yeah, that is bright. Hello, everybody. Uh, so yeah, I worked at NCSA for five years and another uh, university for nine years before that, running Bro in production uh, on kind of two networks. And now I help run Bro and Zeke on many networks. Uh, so this talk is on profiling in production, which mostly the distinction I want to make here is there are things that you could do to profile offline with PCAPs and find issues, but that doesn't help if you have a box on a real network that's falling over and you need to understand why, especially when it's a customer network and you don't own their traffic, so you can't just generate a PCAP, copy it to your laptop, and figure out what's wrong. You have to figure it out in place where it is. Um, next slide. So the general process that I take, I realized, is almost kind of the scientific method. Maybe some scientists could tell me why this is or isn't the scientific method. But it all kind of starts, first you do the profiling. So step one is always collect data, and then analyze the data, and then come up with your hypothesis, which is where it's kind of different. Often you make the mistake of thinking you know what the problem is before you start, and that never works out well, because it's almost never what you think. And then once you kind of think you know what it is, you try to reproduce it and come up with a workaround and a fix. And it seems like workarounds might be bad, but often that's as simple as just disabling a script that you're not using or commenting out a line to at least get the thing working well until the underlying feature can be improved. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three different types of profiling. Uh, memory profiling, which is just where's all your memory going. Core profiling, which is the parts of Zeek that are written in C++, and script profiling, which is obviously uh, the parts that are scripts. So here's a statement. Who agrees with this statement? Anybody? Zeek has memory leaks. That does it? I say you're mostly all wrong. The truth is it has issues with unbounded state growth. And you're probably saying, but that's a memory leak, right? Well, not really. So what even is state? Does anyone know what this is a log of? Does that, has anyone ever seen this before? <laughs> yes. Um, so this is what bro logs looked like 10 years ago. This was the HTTP log from bro 1.5. Uh, not at all like what you're used to. And bro really didn't track a lot of state back then. It basically logged things as it saw them with this little, uh, Where's my cursor? With this little reference number. Wait, where L? No, that's not working. There we go, that little reference number. So if you wanted to correlate one connection to what it's doing later, you have to match up the ones. So actually figuring out who requested reddit.com here is very difficult, because first you have to find this line, see the one, go somehow back in time to find this connection and actually get the IP addresses. And you can imagine, as you know, an analyst, this log is not super useful. You have to do a lot of post-processing to get a single connection. So things are a lot better now, and you have logs that look like this, which is awesome. You have the, the method, the host, the URI, the MIME types, all in one record, which is super easy to understand. Uh, the downside to this is that one of these fields is the response body length. And what's interesting about that is you only know that field at the end. So yes, you saw that it was a request for reddit.com, what the user agent was, but you can't log any of that until it's done and you know that the response body len was 110 kilobytes or so. This means that before you could log that stuff right away, but now we have to build up this big state record in order to log it. And normally this works. It's small pieces of information, but sometimes this goes wrong. And a uh, case where this goes wrong is you can see this, well, REST MIME types, that's a list. You notice it's, it's in brackets. It's not a single value, and why is that? Well, a single HTTP request can actually return more than one response, so we need to log all of them. 
And normally that might be one, maybe two, three things, but sometimes it goes very wrong. Uh, you see this a lot at universities. They loved those like Axis security cameras that used HTTP multi-part motion JPEG, where you do a single get request for you know image.jpg, and it just sends you one JPEG every couple of seconds, which is one request and 50,000 images as a response. So before we fix this, Zeek would happily log for response MIME types image JPEG, image JPEG, image JPEG. So there was no leak, but logging a list of 50,000 image JPEGs takes a lot of memory. You'd end up with 10 megabyte HTTP log entries, which does not make anyone happy. Uh, and so that's unbounded state growth. And to really make this even simpler, Here's an example of a very simple script that simply counts every connection and logs a single value. You could run this on terabytes and terabytes of PCAPs. It only ever counts a single value, never uses memory, and will log a single value at the end. Well, what happens if someone comes along and says, yeah, that's nice, but I want to log the unique connections. I only want to count each five tuple once. So you say, okay. We'll make a set of connections, and for every new connection, we'll add it to the set, and then print it out at the end. This is unbounded state growth, because if you have billions of IP addresses, especially IPv6, over time, this will just continue to grow and grow and grow, and you will run out of memory. And it, I also like to say this is the kind of thing that works in PCAP, because yeah, a small PCAP that you're analyzing, you can run the script just fine. If you try to run this on a real network, you will run out of memory. But, and the interesting thing here is cardinality matters. So going from this script where we track each connection, we put the connection ID in the set, to this one where we put the port. Does this script blow up? Not as quickly? What is, any other answers? Does it blow up after a long time or what? Anybody? Come on, I know, you, you know this. D does this script, no matter how much traffic you throw at it, does it eventually blow up? Why not? Right, there's only 65,000 ports. No matter how much traffic you get, this will only grow to 65,000 entries and stop growing. Once you've seen all the ports, that's it. So cardinality matters. You can do the exact same thing as you were doing in this script, but store a subset of the information and not blow up. Um, as well as expirations. Going back to that previous script where we're restoring all the connections, if we simply expired connections after an hour, you might grow memory for the first hour and then it'll plateau as things start expiring. And that makes a big difference. So the general lessons for understanding what unbounded state growth is and how to fix things is really you need to know what you're storing. And if you're storing a lot of things, look at the hyperloglog -log support that we have where you can actually store a very large number of things with high accuracy but not 100% accuracy without things blowing up. Um, and yes, use expiration timers and also if you know you only need something temporarily, delete it when you no longer need it. So now that some background information, let's go into a great little case study here. This is a before and after of a sensor we were trying to get stable. And you could see kind of the left side, memory was all over the place, low, high, low, high. Basically, workers were running out of memory and restarting. And day after day, no matter what we did, we could not get it stable. So I spent quite a while just figuring out how do we even figure out what this problem is. And the solution ended up being JE malloc, which we support. Uh, you can build bro against it, or Zeek. It's gonna take me a while. Uh, which is like TC malloc, which I think a lot of people are using. The difference is it's a little more maintained. Basically, Facebook employs the JE malloc people. I think all of their stuff links against it. So there's actual effort going into it. Uh, one thing I would like to stress, it may or may not perform better than glibc. I know Mikal tells me that clear Linux with glibc is faster. Um, so I'm not gonna say it's better performance, the one thing I will say, and the reason why you should consider using it, is you can do profiling. 
So you build uh, Bro or Zeek against it with enable JEMalloc. You do need to validate that your JEMalloc is built with profiling. I noticed it's very strange, like I think Ubuntu has it, but Debian doesn't, or CentOS, it, it definitely varies. So if you didn't build it from scratch, you have to do a malloconf, stat sprints true, run Zeek. You need a couple of options, otherwise it won't actually allocate any memory, it turns out. And if you see prof true in your output, you're good to go. If you don't see anything, you're not using JEMalloc. If you do need to build it from scratch because the one on your distribution does not have uh, profiling, you basically need to build JEMalloc with profiling enabled, and this is debatable, but you need some form of either libgc or libunwind, one or one of the two enabled. So once you do that, you can get, you set some environment variables to actually enable profiling. That you want to do profiling, that you want the files called prof.out. The prof interval is basically magic. It's something like the number of bytes in 2 to the 32 where it will write out profiling. You basically just make up a number, and if you don't get any files, you lower it, and if you get 1,000 files, add one or two. It's kind of hard to just know until you enable it for the first time if you have the right value. So when you run that, and you, you run a Zeek worker with this enabled, it starts spitting out tons of files like this. And you open them up, and it's complete gibberish. And the reason why it's gibberish is because you're not supposed to look at them. You're supposed to use JEPROF, which is a tool that you will get if you install JEMalloc. And I think, can everyone read that, hopefully? You basically point JEPROF at the binary you're using and one of those files. And usually the first thing you do is like a top 20. And that'll start telling you what's actually allocating the memory, which is now great, because now you're going from guessing what the problem could be to hopefully seeing. So this was kind of a test that I reproduced that's showing, well, some X509 file analysis is using 28% of the memory, and X509 common parse extension is using 35%. So we already know something with X509 processing. And there's also another way of looking at this in JEPROF where you can just do the cumulative output, which is kind of neat because you can go from the start. So main is using 100%, and then as we start processing packets, that's 98%, and as you go further down, you start seeing 72% is the SSL analyzer, so now you know 72% of the memory is being used by the SSL analyzer, and you get further and further down until you see that it's that same parse extension. So, and a third way of looking at this is you can use uh, SVG output, and, oh, I just realized that's not even full screen. If I can, tab, no, control, one second here. This is what I get for not mirroring my displays. Ah, here we go. You can get the SVG showing all the same thing, the full tree of going from 100% of the memory usage at the top, following the hierarchy of what is allocating the memory. So you can see all of this is just, you know, things aren't actually allocating the memory, it's just the things that they're calling are allocating memory. And eventually, as it goes through the stack of the core, you get into the X509 analyzer, and it helpfully makes the problem very large and big, and you could see, hey, you know, parsing the sands, we're apparently allocating a lot of memory and holding references to that memory, which are also strings. So at this point, you have a pretty good idea, so something we're doing is parsing uh, certificates and keeping the uh, certificate information in memory. Um, Yes, and SVG. So the fix for that turned out to be one of the things I talked about, we're deleting data as soon as you no longer need it. Apparently we track a lot of information for that state because we want to build it up so you can use it in your scripts and so you could log it. However, it turns out there's a lot of SSL information that we parse and analyze and store and track that we don't really use again once the records are logged. However, this information doesn't get cleared until the connections are closed. So with a tiny couple of lines script, you can say, okay, as soon as the SSL uh, handshake is finished, clear out all that data. 
And that was the difference on that machine between memory growing constantly and running out and running perfectly stable. And I have a package that I'm working on getting on GitHub that you can install that will fix this. So don't bother copying and pasting this. It'll be on GitHub very soon. Um, and it's kind of shown there's room for improvement in the SSL analyzer to kind of cache and remember when certs are parsed you know, over and over again that we don't need to store all this data because it's very repetitive. Um, but it seems very simple in hindsight, but without the profiling directing me to this, I would never have realized that this is what the problem was. Um, another thing that JEProf was really useful in finding is as I was working on this, something kept showing up, this thing called rule matcher init endpoint. I had no idea what this was. I've never seen it before. A uh, neat thing you could do in JEProf is you can call list and give it the name of a function. And it'll actually, if you have the source code on the machine, it'll annotate that function and actually tell you which lines are responsible for the memory allocation. So I did that and it told me this, which also still didn't really mean anything to me. But I added some prints to kind of figure out what the rules were that we were generating and using so much memory and found that we had a bug. Uh, back a while ago when we switched from using libmagic to just using signatures for detecting mime types, we added a ton of new signatures for you know, video and uh, office documents and things like that. It turned out on a new connection, we were initializing all those patterns even though we didn't need to. So I reported this as a bug, and John, I think, fixed it in like 20 minutes. It was actually, I think, the smallest fix I've ever seen. It was a like one character change or something like that, one word to just don't initialize them, and that saves a huge chunk of memory. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. The downside to JEProf that hopefully we'll figure out how to fix and improve upon is sometimes it's not helpful at all. Sometimes you have a problem and you look at the profiling and you get output like this that tells you, okay, all of your memory is tables. What table? Like, doesn't, doesn't tell you. And even if you do the um, SVG and you go through, where's my cursor? You go through, all, ooh, go through all the scripts, yeah, it tells you, yeah, it was a function that evaluated something and had a statement and we put it in a table. And it's, it's useless. You know, yeah, okay, we're putting too much stuff in tables. But there's no information about what the table was. Uh, so we are trying to figure out how we can extend JEProf to teach it more about Broso or Zeek. So when you see a function call, actually just replace that with the name of the script function and not just say it was a function call. Um, Oh no, this is just any, anything that's pure kind of script code, allocating tables and putting things in the tables. Once JE Malik sees it, it doesn't really know what it was anymore. It, it doesn't have the knowledge to know that functions and statements and if expressions have script file names attached to them, that that's what we need. We don't need the fact that it was, you know, a bro funk or a bro event. That's not helpful. Uh, so one thing we did use to do this, or once we realized this kept happening, we actually took a big look at how tables and dictionaries were implemented, and there were a couple of things we were able to improve. So I have a quiz, and I'm told I can give away like $20 Amazon gift cards and expense them. So can anyone figure out or, or tell me what, you know, Zeke is running, it's making a ton of tables and dictionaries and tracking all the state, what is the most common size? You know, 100 items, 1,000 items? Wait, who's, who said zero? First, who's, who said zero first? When it, someone said zero, I don't know who said zero first. All right, yes, yeah, so I need to talk to you after. So yeah, it turns out if you, if, if you profile it and actually look, don't just assume, and you add some debug statements uh, does Zeke can run it on a big PCAP. It turns out, yeah, the most common table size never gets anything put in it. And you might say, well, that's insane. Like, why would you make so many tables? But 
you might have things to track state, then you never end up putting anything in it. Or you might have a C service, and the connection never has a service. Well, that's a table. So it turns out one of the simple uh, improvements we made that it's in 3.0 is just don't initialize a table until someone puts something in it, which seems kind of obvious now, but some of that code was written 20 years ago, and it had never really been uh, looked into with that much detail. Uh, so yeah, so as I talked about, there's a lot of improvements we can make here uh, to make this even better, mostly in the script performance side of things to just understand, once it, once it leaves the core, if it's not an analyzer doing it, if it's not C++ allocating memory, we need to kind of rewrite a good chunk of JE malloc to understand things. And then also JEProf itself is not super useful, and or it, it, it's kind of slow, it basically is the thing. So kind of updating, it's this gigantic inscrutable Perl program. Any Perl developers? Not, yeah, exactly. So. Someone needs to actually optimize that a bit for running multiple times. You run it once, you're fine, but if you're running it over and over again on different files, it takes a while. Uh, and automating the profiling would be nice, but since I started the slides, I did that. I have a package that's in the package manager now that helps you do this, because all you need to do the profiling is set some environment variables, but it's kind of tricky, because usually you only want to do it on one worker. You don't want to do it on all of them, unless you're having, you know, worker seven keeps running out of memory, generally you have 20 workers, they're all kind of representative, so you don't need 20 times as much data, you just want to enable on the first one. So the plugin helps you do that, and there's some code that outputs to JSON. And I have a slide, but if I can, oh wow, this is difficult. Um, come on, I have it running here somewhere. No, not that. This is not going well. Really? Very secure. Logs me out every 10 minutes. Figured this would be a little more interesting than a slide. So if you run the plugin and run the other file I have that converts the files into JSON and you throw it into something like Humio, you can get really cool graphs like this that show over time what's actually allocating all that memory. And the neat thing is, this is what's actually in use, not just what like the OS has allocated. So you'll actually see it go down, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, this is all from that one source of data. And just looking at different views of it. And yeah, look at this all the time. So you can do this too. Uh, all right, get back to my presentation. Question? You, you do because it's based, oh, actually, there is a way in JE Malloc, I believe, to do it at runtime, but you. Yes, what, what I found is, especially only enabling on one worker, there's hardly any overhead. Yeah, one worker is barely any overhead. There's not an unimaginable amount of data, so. Yeah, what I found interesting is there's, there's a website for J.E. Malik where they talk about how to do this, and I went on their chat and I asked, well, how do people do this in production? And they're like, yeah, we do it, but we don't really talk about how we do it. So I think this talk might actually be one of the first ones that I could find where people talk about how to actually run J.E. Malik profiling in production, get the data out of it, put it into a system where you can make sense and visualize it. And hopefully if someone has something better out there, I can learn about it, but as far as I could tell, no one talks about it, but it's great. So that's pretty much what I have on memory profiling. I'm probably a little behind schedule because I maybe only have like 30 more slides. So I might have to speed up a bit. It's, it's, it's fine. Um, so this goes on to more of the core profiling. One of the first things I worked on when I joined Correlate was got pointed at this box that was dropping a lot of packets, but it was doing it in a way that I've never seen before. So there's two lines, the, the bigger line is packets per second, and the smaller red line is drops. So when I started looking at this, it made no sense to me. Because you notice, day after day, the traffic kind of stays the same. It's, it's a company, you know, Monday through Friday, very cyclic, but you notice the drops get worse every day. And you notice there's times in the middle of the night when the traffic goes through the roof, but drops is fine. 
So one thing you might be thinking, you know, I talked about the beginning, is state growth. So clearly, the only thing different from one day to the next has to be some state somewhere. Something in this is getting hosed, and then the next day it's slower, and then the next day it's slightly slower. And you notice, this is better. What did we do? Well, we restarted the workers. And that's what you see here. It's just, just to see if that fixes it, because you don't know. Like, maybe it's the traffic. So all the workers, every single core on this box is maxed out at 100. Restart the workers, everything drops down to, I can't really read it, but it's like 20%. So it's like, what the hell? Like, a minute ago, I was analyzing the same traffic, and my load was 100%. Now I'm analyzing the same traffic, and my load is 20%. How did it get into the state? And what the hell is it doing when the load gets so high? So basically, came back four days later when it broke again, because it took, takes four days, and use perf. Does anyone use perf now on Linux? Cool, so a couple of people familiar. So perf is, in newer kernels, you can inspect a process and find out what it's doing with relatively low overhead. Thinks you might have used strace or ltrace. It's basically a much more efficient way of doing that. So you get perf and you run it on one of the workers and you see this. And anytime you see really anything over 10%, you probably have a problem. In this case, we saw two different functions in the base list class taking 40% CPU. And basically, this is horrible. That, that should be 1%, if anything. The fact that it was essentially spending all of its time in lists, that's really not good. Uh, so I was able to grab a quick backtrace using GDB. That might be a bit too small. Um, can I zoom in? So basically, you can start at the top and see that, yeah, we're in base list remove, but how did we get there? Well, it's trying to remove something from a dictionary, which is a table, and all this, all this stuff. And then at the end, something about tables expiring. So it's like, OK, we're expiring some table, and we're just totally broken. And one neat thing you could do, which is this is the thing we need to teach J. Malik how to do, is if you print the right variable in GDB, you can find out what file in line you're doing. So we did that, and it says tunnels main. Has anyone ever looked at the tunnels main script? I had never looked at the tunnels main script. Uh, and we brought this up, and this is kind of the relevant bits. And this is another quiz, so another $20. Can anyone say what is weird about this? There's something weird. <coughs> That, that why this relatively innocent tunnel script was just completely breaking the entire box. So, yeah, it took, took me a bit. It wasn't immediately obvious. But it's, I can tell you, it's something that no other script ever written has ever done, because I looked. And I think Seth wrote it, so blame him. Nobody? All right, I'm running out of time, so I can give you another couple of seconds, but I might have to spoil it if no one. All right, what are people saying? One at a time. I, th I think I heard it, but like eight people were. Yeah, who's, who said that? Yeah, what is it doing? Yes, it's. So you make tables, and you say you want to delete something, and we will happily delete it when it expires. But what this was doing, due to just it use the function for two different things, it was in the expire function also deleting the thing, which you don't need to do. And at first you might say, well, that's broken. But we had code to handle this. It should have worked. And it took me a good two days to reproduce why this is a problem. And Basically, everything has to go wrong. You need thousands of entries in this table because it has to be larger than the expire size of like 5,000 entries. You need the last thing in the batch that you're expiring to have expired and a couple of other things. It basically has to go horribly wrong. So I, I verified this that, OK, when you have such a table that has a lot of items in it and you start expiring entries from it, um, it doesn't expire as fast as it should because it thinks it's done. But that didn't quite explain, that would explain why memory would grow because we're not expiring this table as fast as we should. That didn't fully explain why 
CPU just totally broke. But I looked more into it and was able to reproduce it and found the actual root cause that that just one little line would completely break an entire box in that once you make that mistake and it, had, it hit the bug, the table would end up in an inconsistent state where it would think someone is still iterating over it when no one is iterating over it. And because of that, our code that rebalances hash tables would never run. So you would end up with a hash table that was effectively a like 10 million entry link list, which is why base list was spending all of its time trying to remove items. Because normally a hash table, you know, you have the buckets, you should have five things, three things, not a million things. So, yeah, one little script. And I checked, in every script we've ever shipped and every script ever written in the package manager, no one has ever deleted the item redundantly in an expire function, ever. And yeah, you basically needed, I think, something like 2,000 proxy connections a second to trip this bug. And this one customer network pushes all of their traffic through proxies. So probably one of the only networks ever that you would run into this bug on. Because it's, it's been broken for like 10 years and no one ran into this problem. No one, you needed 10,000 proxy connections a second, or 2,000, something like some, some insane number uh, to run into this problem. So yeah, so that was perf. All right, another quick case study of how perf was super useful to track down performance problems. Uh, we have an entire like QA group that we have an Ixia that generates many gigabits and we have an Arista splitting the traffic where we can send it to old appliances and new appliances. And we got this report that they were seeing drops in 2.6 but not 2.5 and couldn't quite understand why. And the weird thing was it was such a small amount of drops. Like if we didn't have the older appliance that would run all night with zero drops, we might have just written it off. You know, 4,000 4, packets dropped after millions and millions of packets, like whatever. But, but we knew the previous version was fine. So came up with this process to use perf record to do a one minute perf capture constantly, just every minute, just do a new one, but delete the file unless we saw drops. And if we did see drops, use perf to filter it down to just the core that the drops were seen on, set this up, and basically come back in the morning. And hopefully maybe we have a file or two. And we did. Uh, but I needed a good way to analyze it, and that's where Flamescope comes in. It's a tool that Netflix released as open source that lets you analyze perf output kind of in a split, uh, very low granularity. So you imagine just a really long tape of profiling samples and then kind of wrap it over itself. So each second is one line, one vertical line. So, so it's not an x-axis and y-axis. It's t Time is the only axis. So we do this. We come back in the morning. I have a file. I throw it into flame scrub, and I see this. Anyone see what the problem is? All you flame scope experts? Is it maybe the line in the middle? <laughs> Because I, I had never, so yeah, on the, on the Netflix website, which I can't really see here, yeah, they showed all these examples. Like, this is what it might look like. And I'm thinking, okay, I might get something like this. But no, we got a line. And what's cool is, you know, just like me, brand new Flamescope expert, you click the red part, and you get this. And does anyone know what the problem was? What was the problem? Come on. Oh, too, too small? Yeah, calf multiplexer. The, I mean, this took days of working out this process and figuring out how to capture the data and coming back overnight. And in two seconds with the right tools, calf multiplexer. And we were able to work with John and the calf people and I think we figured out how to make this not happen. But yeah, this was basically one second, or if I go back. This was basically an issue for one second out of one minute of like 12 hours worth of data that the multiplexer was a problem. So finding this needle in a haystack was almost impossible until we worked out the process. And yeah, and the neat thing is if you looked at the flame graph of the entire thing, well, now calf is this little slice on the right. 
So it's only even when you know to look at that one slice in the middle that you even recognize that there's a problem. Um, so without the ability to dig in, you don't realize how, you know, calf was 3% of the whole thing, but it was 100% of that one second in the middle. And that's very different. All right, where is my cursor? All right. So, yep, and flim graph. Another issue that has come up that we, I think, finally fixed is we would see boxes that were very happy, and then one worker would just 100%. All the other workers, 50, 60, 70%. One worker, 100%. What is it doing? Well, you'd run perftop, and you'd see this is the annoying C++ mangling. So this is really just reassembler, check overlap, and reassembler add and check. Just, oh, my bad, my bad. Where did I go? Sorry. Apparently, Zoom does not work the way I thought it did. There we go. Yeah, so it's really just the two functions, reassembler add and check, reassembler check overlap. So we kept seeing this on networks, but it was almost impossible to figure out how it got that way. So yeah, clearly it's getting some TCP traffic that's triggering a bug that we have somewhere, and we can't figure out how to cause it because we don't quite know exactly what the problem is, but we see it. We see it all the time. Um, and getting, using that same process of getting perf top views and narrowing it down to when the, the spike occurred, we can see this was almost five seconds, and you look it up, and just as was expected, it was spending almost all of its time doing reassembler check overlap and reassembler add and check for that five seconds. So literally, all of a sudden, one minute, we spend five seconds doing nothing but reassembler, which is obviously not helpful. But unlike the other problem, we didn't really know where to start to fix it. And other than being able to say there's something wrong with the reassembler, we didn't really know where to start. So I modified that previous process to use the dash W option that we have that'll write a PCAP. And basically almost do the same thing, but a couple of tweaks. One, only do this on one worker. On you know, 20 gigabits of traffic, you can't write every single worker to disk all the time. That's two gigabytes a second, and we didn't have the storage or really the capacity just to deal with that. So take one worker, assume this problem will eventually occur, write that worker's PCAP the disk, and get the perf output. If the perf output talks about reassembler, save that PCAP. And I wrote this, and I think it might have actually taken me more than two days because the first one had a bug and kept the wrong file because I forgot to sort it. So basically, almost probably a week later, after working out, after first having this problem, I was able to get a PCAP, anonymized it, sent it to John, and John did his magic. And in, John, is this in 3 or will this be in 3.1? This this will be in 3.1, where the worst case performance of like pathological broken TCP connection is now uh, 75 times faster. So, and I'm sure many people in the room have been having this problem and you just don't realize it. You just get a spike of drops and you don't know why it's a good reason is probably it's the reassembler and this will be fixed in 3.1, which is awesome. Um, all right, and that's the core profiling bits. Uh, as far as script profiling, we have a plugin that we've been using to drive a lot of the analysis, but weren't able to get it open sourced in time for Zeek Week. Conveniently, Vlad at ESNet, who you saw earlier today, released a Prometheus plugin, or a Bro plugin for Prometheus to export similar stats out of a running Zeek worker about what scripts are running, what functions are being called. So definitely check that out and uh, yeah, it, it looks awesome. I basically wish I had it years ago. Um, and once you have what scripts are running and what events are being called, you start to see some patterns. So here's an example of uh, a lesson I learned, which is you really want to defer work as late as possible. This is a pull request for the catch and release script. And you notice the change that I made was just to move that thing lower. And well, why did I do that? And it's because first, you know, it makes that entity, and then it checks if the thing it's looking at is in the blocks. And if it's not in the blocks, this function doesn't do anything. 
and then it checks if basically the feature is enabled and I'm on a cluster and I'm on the right node, then it uses that. But, well, what if this address was not in blocks? We don't use this variable. So improving the performance of the catch and release script was very simple. Uh, defer the allocation of the thing until you need to use it, uh, which is something that comes up a lot. Uh, so generally, writing scripts, if you can abort early, abort early before allocating any variables, before looking at any strings, before checking things in sets. You want to do the simplest check you can first and abort. So just basically being lazy and deferring that allocation uh, improved performance a ton. What's interesting though is we did that and um, it made it faster, but it still kept showing up in profiling. Geez, like this catch and release script is still like two or three percent of runtime at times. And the fix for that was kind of simple, which is don't load it anymore. Has anyone in this room used catch and release script in production? I don't know if Ashish is here. I think he might be the only one. So this, this is probably running if you're, unless you're running, I think, 3.0. The script is loaded, it's running, it's inspecting a ton of events. It's never doing anything because you're probably not actually using that feature at runtime. But the scripts are loaded. So starting in, I think, 3.0, we moved it from base to policy. So now it's only loaded if you're using that feature. Um, and yeah, it's something like a two or three percent performance increase across the board just by not loading a script that looks at every connection because you don't need it. Um, another lesson we learned a lot in scripts is that strings can be really slow. There's a lot of scripts that do something like this. Like I noticed JA3 does this at times to build up the JA3 fingerprint before it hashes it. Uh, Python optimized this a while back, but Zeek still doesn't have the optimization to do this. So don't do this. What you want to do is use a string vec. And instead of appending to a string, you append to a string vec and you call join string vec with either the empty string or if you wanted comma separated, you can do comma separated. Uh, one thing that not a lot of people know about is that if the whole reason why you're doing this is to take a hash, you actually don't even need the full string. You can start a hash, add little strings to it, and then finish and get the final string. Um, actually, I have a quick demo of that. Is this going? Oh no, wrong screen. Wrong screen, okay. Uh, oh, come on. I really needed to mirror my displays, I guess. There we go. So I have this project I started a while ago called Bro Benchmarking. But apparently I forgot to put it on GitHub and no one ever asked me about it. So <laughs> it's, it's basically a way to do different script variations. So oh, well, I need to make this bigger. So string MD5 dynamic. So there's, um, so the string method, uh, sorry, which looks like this, or the vec one, which looks like this. And the really cool thing that I have support for is arbitrarily making stuff work. So I can do number, number, five, and get five appends. And the cool thing is, so when you run this, comparing string to vec, I think that works. So the string approach takes uh, 4.3 seconds, 4.1 seconds, 4.1 seconds. The vector approach takes less, and it's pretty consistent. I don't know what happened to my terminal. Oh no, I can't see. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. There we go. And instead of one, if I do, say, seven appends, so instead of just appending one at the beginning, one at the end, and one in the middle, now I'm appending seven extra strings. Now the string concatenation approach takes closer to seven seconds, and that'll finish in a couple of seconds. So this kind of gets more into the reproducing, but it's usually the next step. Once you, you've done profiling, it's pointed you at a script, you kind of want to see, well, if I did write this script differently, and this script was spending 100% of its time doing this one thing, 
is my new variation faster? And you could see, once we start appending a lot of strings, all of a sudden the vector approach is 50% the runtime compared to string concatenation. So huge, huge difference there. And oops, I lost my speaker notes. So yeah, there's still a ton of improvements that we can make to profiling just to make this easier for everybody. Brendan Gregg, who's the Netflix employee who worked a bit on Flamescope and kind of wrote one of the earlier kind of Bibles on profiling, is writing a new book on how to do profiling. And there's a ton of new features in Linux. So as soon as that book is available, we're going to get a couple of copies and learn some of these new techniques and hopefully make profiling Zeek even better than it is now. Um, and yeah, under, understanding the, the internals of Zeek is, is a big issue. J.E. Malik has issues with it. Perf also doesn't fully understand internals. As soon as we can get something that understands that functions are really scripts and they need to expand uh, the actual file name and line number, things will get so much better for everybody. Uh, and that's mostly what I have. Uh, I have links when I publish the slides, have links to everything I talk about and all of the various issues from the past year that profiling has helped us find and fix. And I'm probably uh, forgetting a couple. So yeah, that's a lot of what I spent the last year on is seeing problems, profiling them, figuring out what's broken, and getting all of the fixes merged upstream. So every single improvement that we found and made is in Git right now. So any questions? I know that was a lot. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, for like the JE Malik profiling? Yeah. So that is a problem. Um, so I wrote the plugin and I thought I had it done and it worked, but only if it's a cluster in a box. Because JE and Prof will write the files locally, you have to get you have to run the script that converts the JSON on the box. As far as once you do that, you can just index it into Splunk or Humeo or Elastic and report on it. It's really just I don't know a good way with Zeek plugins to run arbitrary Python code on the worker nodes, which is what we need to do. Um, and it's mostly just kind of sysadmin stuff to just get the Python running to process the files and index them. So, all right, that is very bright. All right, if there's no other questions, yeah. Thanks for having me again. <laughs>